morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Philip Gorino, and I'm really delighted to welcome you to the third of our four-part four series around exits with our trusted partner, STS Capital Partners. Uh, for more information about Harvard Alumni Entrepreneurs, our programming and sponsorship opportunities, please uh, visit us at harvardae.org. Um, selling a business can be a complex and daunting process uh, from finding the right buyer to addressing legal concerns to ensuring that you receive the best possible value for your company. Uh, this special series brings together seasoned experts from STS Capital Partners who will provide actionable advice on industry best practices, avoiding and navigating potential pitfalls, and ultimately achieving a, a successful exit. In this third webinar, we'll be discussing how to appeal to strategic buyers, presented by SCS's Capital, um, SCS Capital's Managing Director, Shamil Hargavan. Shamil will provide valuable insights on how to identify strategic buyers for your business, how to understand their values, and what all buyers have in common, a search for solutions that can help them achieve their long-term goals and objectives. Just some housekeeping, uh, Shamil will be presenting um, and we will uh, be sure to allow time for ample time for questions from the audience. So please feel free to add any questions you might have into the general chat box. Please don't um, uh, message Shamil directly. He's, he's going to be focused on his presentation um, and we'll do the, our, our best to address them. And also please uh, turn your cameras on if possible. So without further ado, welcome Shamil. It's a really fantastic to have you today. Thank you. My, my pleasure. It is uh, not lost upon me that several people are in the middle of their workday taking the time to be here. So I hope to make this fun, engaging, informative, and helpful. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, and, you know, what I will say, yes, we'll leave questions for the end, but if somebody in the middle of this just has a burning question, and it's really important to get an answer right away, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, that'll make it a little more interactive and give me a sense for where the audience is in terms of understanding the content or what's what's really um, hitting home for folks. Um, so with that, Angie's going to drive. I'll just do kind of a next slide as we go here, Angie. Um, and again, thank you all for being here. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this other than, other than to say that, um, you know, I'm fortunate to have lived in different parts of the world, Australia, Africa, and uh, North America. And I find this is probably the, the, the most important and fun gig I've ever had, which is working with owners and entrepreneurs uh, as they think about their next stages and, and they think about their strategic options. Um, and so I come from the corporate background consulting and then into uh, uh, selling my own company and now helping others do it. Let's keep going. So a little bit about STS Capital Partners. We're 20 years old. Uh, the company uh, is global and we were founded on this premise that in a lot of business schools today, they teach the corporate finance side really well. The strategy side is not always taught well. And the strategy side is understanding what is the strategic in, uh, impetus for someone to go about a, a, a buyer side process and trying to get your company under their wing um, and you know, reframing the conversation. So today, I hope we really, if there's anything you take away from this is what does it mean to sell to strategics? Uh, let's keep going. So we're about 33 partners globally. Every uh, All of us have been former entrepreneurs who've exited and now are uh, working to support other folks on that journey. Um, that makes us very different from your Wall Street, High Street, Bay Street type bank. Um, nothing against those groups, but we like to think we get the integrity of a smaller firm with the reach of a global one. And that's what we're proud of uh, being able to deliver. Another thing that's really germane to STS is we have 4,200 advisors around the world. And it really does help when it comes to reaching the right uh, strategic investors. Okay. I just want to uh, start by framing the, the who, the how, and the why. So our why is to create billions of dollars of new impact and philanthropic capital through M&A. Uh, I would challenge you to find another firm that focuses purely on that. Um, we like to think of ourselves as who. I just mentioned who we are. We're, we're, we're all former entrepreneurs supported by an amazing team of about 150 to 200 practitioners. 
And um, the, the how we do it is through selling to strategics, getting strategic buyers to look at your business in the, for the integrated value and not just for your EBITDA, your profits, and your revenue. Uh, next slide. So this is, uh, yeah, uh, next, yep, there we go. If you just don't mind building the first section there. So interesting tidbit here, but in terms of the world economy, 75% uh, off North or US economy are, are basically owner operated family businesses, maybe multi-generation, other cases founded in one lifetime, other cases only been around six years. The point being it's entrepreneur led or, or owner led businesses. Um, that number goes up even higher as you start to get to Lat LATAM, AU, Asia Pacific and Africa. And so that's the majority of our economy that creates most of the jobs are these kinds of businesses, not your publicly traded companies that are listed on the stock exchange, for example. And in the middle, we have what we would call the financial landscape or set of buyers and strategic investors. The most common two that everyone knows and talks about are VCs and PEs. Now, I'm not here to pick on PE and, and VCs. They have a purpose. They serve a role. But let's just be very clear about what a VC's goal is. A VC's goal is to make 10 bets. Nine of them don't do so well, or eight of them don't do so well. The other two do, and they put the rest of their powder into those two. So just when the companies that need the help the most um, find themselves needing more capital, it's in, interestingly enough, that's when the VCs desert you and you're back to, what do I do next? And the more and more of your company you give, um, the more and more control of your company you give. So you find yourself in that kind of situation. Um, and look, there are great examples, and that's the 1% of the 1%, where VC-backed companies that actually IPO end up having a great IPO. That's about 1% of 1%. But that makes about 50 to 60% of our journalistic folklore on M&A. <laughs> and the rest of the story is all the other companies in the world that have these tremendous exits, but you don't hear about them. So I want to shed a bit of light on that. The PE business model uh, is often I'm going to buy low, roll some things up together, so maybe buy several things low and sell high. And again, not so conducive to maximizing value for the founders, the owners, the operators, and the people who actually build the company. And so what we try to do is take you directly to the strategics who think about your company in terms of integrated value. And, and that's what STS focuses on. And we've been doing that for 20 years, very successfully with very successful outcomes. Um, let's keep going. So I just want to kind of share, and, and by the way, this is part of a larger series. There's a lot more to say about understanding your outcomes. When is the right time? What's your capital strategy? And I'm happy to take questions on those things. But two of my colleagues have covered that in other sessions if you've attended. So I'm focusing very much on the, you know, how do you actually sell the strategics? What does that process look like? And what are the best practices? So what I would say to everyone here is, the first is reframing the opportunity. And when we say reframing the opportunity, it's not based on purely your financial metrics. It's really more about what is the value of this opportunity to the folks who are looking at it? And, and you know, that's where the true untapped potential is because you can't quantify, for example, the value of Beats being bought by Apple um, and what that's going to do for Apple's bottom line and top line, right? That's where you want to start positioning the story. Not, hey, my company's got 100 million, it's got 20 million in EBITDA, therefore I should have a multiple of 10 times and that's what we're trading at. That's not how you go about M&A. Um, and that's oftentimes how you're told to think about M&A. So I don't know if that, that sort of supports and helps. Um, I can't stress the importance of listening carefully and understanding why, why a strategic investor is in love with your business. That's so critical uh, when you go down that process. And that's a big part of what we do and help, help our clients do. The second is driving the actual process itself. So, you know, there are things like having a best practice of having a certain amount of cash on hand, coming in from a position of strength, and then driving what we call a soft auction. Um, so often people have this view of M&A, you're, you know, you're at a fancy lunch, a dinner, someone puts a piece of a number on a piece of paper, slides it across the desk, and somehow, you know, we're talking and negotiating a price. I have to tell you, it does never works that way. I've never seen it that way. <laughs> and uh, what I would emphasize is selling to strategics is a much more collaborative approach. 
It's building a relationship for the long haul with a strategic buyer and not being transactional purely. They want to know that when they take this on, they truly are entering into something that's going to be worth them investing precious hard cash off their balance sheet into your vision that you've started. And so uh, negotiating the best outcomes is how do you take what's often an asymmetric relationship, multi-billion dollar uh, company with, say, your $100 million company? How do you negotiate and create leverage in that situation? So these are some of the principles we'll go through in a, in a couple of key uh, stories and tidbits. Okay, let's start with reframing your business. So far, so good. Can I get a thumbs up if we're kind of all tracking? Any, anything that's standing out for people? Okay, great. All right, so on your left, you've got what we would call financial investors or buyers, and you've got your strategic investors or buyers. Your financial, we talked about their motivations. They're, they're oftentimes, just understand the, what's behind the financial buyer. A financial buyer normally has an LP, a limited partner or a set of investors in their firm. They're promising a certain return rate. Their goal is to come in and drive that return rate. And it has very little to do with what can I do with this business to drive value. They ultimately then try to sell it to a strategic. And what we're saying is the strategics are the ones who tend to pay the most. A little tidbit on where the world sits today during COVID, um, private equity had its way off the world. They did a lot of deals in the last two and a half years and they got great prices. And a lot of those now private equity firms are trying to roll up companies to sell or bring take public. Um, the strategics on the other hand, were worried about laying off people, couldn't predict the future, not sure what's going on in the world. And what we're seeing, in fact, we saw this last quarter, a record amount of activity with strategic buyers and or selling companies, selling to strategic buyers. And it's really tied by the fact that they've been out innovated. During COVID, they slowed down. And it's always the startups, the smaller companies, the nimble companies that, that work would change better. Yes, there were some massive winners in tech during COVID. But by and large, strategists got left behind. And now they're on a shopping spree. So it, we're kind of in this interesting two to three year window where we think there's going to be a tremendous amount of activity from strategics. Let's keep going. So, you know, this is, I'm sure anyone who's taken accounting 101 or corporate finance will know what a SWOT analysis is. I just want you to think about how, uh, and I'm going to give you actual examples with the company's names redacted of how we would actually frame um, the SWOT when we're going through the process of reframing the business. So uh, can we go to the next slide? Here's company X. Uh, company X is a, um, basically what they have is a, very unique material that allows them to uh, 3D print metal in, a, in a, a way that does not cause the building to blow up, but also in a way that allows for rocket ships, performance cars, and you know space technology companies to use it and get properties that are just unique. So you think about a company like this, and we look at where they are, like any normal company, there's going to be some strengths, weaknesses at the time when you're going to market. So in this particular case, you know, we can talk about all the things that had IP strong team, but they also had a, a cash issue. And so part of that is shoring up potentially non-dilutive capital going into that sale process. In fact, the probably the most impressive examples of cashing up before a sale that I can point to, if anyone's familiar with Salesforce and the Relate IQ deal, uh, Relate IQ raised $60 million before selling for $400 million to Salesforce. Here's a dirty secret. They had $1 million in revenue. So what they were able to tell uh, Salesforce is, unless you buy us now, we're going to go steal your lunch and you'll have to pay more later. And, and they were cashed up. So sometimes having a strategic raise before M&A, or at least having enough where that you can't, where they can't ride you out in the negotiation um, is very, very critical. So think about it from a lens of how do you have leverage with your strategic uh, investor at the time of uh, running any, any kind of minority or majority transaction? Um, Obviously, in the opportunity side and threat side, you always look about at competition. I will tell you this much. Competition is probably one of the most throwaway slides in, in any kind of process. Because if you've got sticky customers and you've got your own way to drive the, the TAM opportunity you're driving, you know, very little gets either discounted or increased based on your competitive market share. They want to know uh, what your customers do with your products and your services. Let's keep going. And I'm going to do these quick. You know, we can always come back to them. 
but I'm going to do these examples quick just to try and bring a bit of the, th uh, the theory into a real world example of what we would do with a client. Uh, let's go to company Y. This company here is um, forefront of climate technology, doing some amazing things in, um, in, in uh, the kind of energy space. And again, you know, in their particular case, one of the, the key insights was, um, you know, they were in a position where they realized in order to scale at the speed that they're being asked to scale, they need a strategic to come along. In fact, some of the smartest founder owner operators I've ever come across are the ones that have the humbleness to say, look, this is going to take billions of dollars more to take it to my true vision. And I wouldn't mind if there was a strategic that came along for the ride, rather than me going and raising a bunch of VC rounds and getting uh, diluted and losing control of my vision along the way. So it takes a certain kind of owner to think clearly and make that kind of decision. And some of our most successful outcomes have been ones where that's been the position of the owner or the founder. Let's keep going. So your typical value drivers, in when, it, when you're kind of taught the typical M&A playbook or the strategic investor playbook is let's look at your financials, your forecast, your performance, your audited, not audited. You know, do you have your tax? Do you have your data room? And by the way, all this is very useful. Let's not take anything away from that. But I can assure you, if that's all you did, you've just, you've lost 50% or more of the opportunity. So we start to think about what are your actual Rembrandts in the attic? So let's go to the next slide. So there's a famous uh, example. Husband and wife are buying homes. They're deciding to buy a home. They're looking for a home. And they start looking at places. They've looked at 50 and they got outbid a bunch of times. They're, you know, stressed out. And turns out the, the wife and the family is an art expert. So they're lo looking through one of the homes and all of a sudden she goes up to the attic. Turns out there's a Rembrandt in the attic, an actual original Rembrandt. No one knew it was there. It was just kind of sitting there. And they thought, okay, that's interesting. She whispers over to her husband and says, hey, I think we should bid more for this together. We've got the balance sheet to do it. Let's go for it. Broker is happier than ever because broker's thinking, oh, someone just bid 55, you know, 50 percent over off asking. That's amazing. Um, and so they're very happy and they decide to go ahead and do the deal with this couple. Turns out that the Rembrandt is worth four times the price of the house. So what's the story here? The the strategic, in this case, the couple saw something in the business that they go, I know, I, I know how this is way more valuable than the traditional way of valuing this opportunity and asset. They found something and it. it might be your supply chain, or I have a billion customers and I can charge them all $5 more for your product. And therefore I'm going to make, you know, $5 billion more in revenue a year. And that's going to allow me to pay for the uh, strategic investment I'm making. That is how buyers like to think. They almost like to think they're smarter than you and they don't know, um, you don't know just how much you're truly worth. That is the best kind of situation to create for a strategic. So in this case, you know, we looked at all the things that these guys have that would be what we call Rembrandts in the attic. And we identified several key interesting Rembrandts. Another one, you know, on the financial side can be something as simple as I have a publicly traded company. My EBITDA sits at 30% average for all my product lines. Yours is at 70%. And therefore, hey, I'm going to be able to drive a story of how I'm improving the overall uh, value. That's more of a financial metric. But a metric like, hey, you know, um, I've got in this Relate, I Relate IQ Salesforce scenario, for example, Relate IQ said, hey, everyone using Salesforce IQ, our gateway drug to Salesforce, they're going to be able to leverage that and create billions of dollars in subscription revenue. So that plus the stock price increase alone justified the big strategic investment. So far, so good? Okay. Let's go to company uh, Y in this situation. So this is the one at the forefront of climate tech. And they had a whole bunch of other opportunities um, that, that someone could, could drive. And sometimes it's something silly like, hey, I'm in one adjacency. And I see this opportunity to be in this other adjacency because I already own the customer that's going to buy the other product. And so that's the kind of thing a strategic thinks about. And if you don't take the time to understand it, you're leaving way too much on the table. So quick story, our founder um, actually exited his business for sev uh, 17 times EBITDA. And he was 29 years old. He's now in his 60s. He's lived a great life, done a lot of philanthropy, a great guy. And what we learned through that experience, or he learned through that experience, was when he went on to buy another company in a similar space, uh, years later, he asked for the file. 
And the file said they would have paid up to 100 times EBITDA. What was the insight in that particular one? The, the insight was that the, uh, the, in this case, strategic investor needed a Canadian arm to get a multi-billion dollar deal with General Motors. And that's why they wanted the company. It had nothing to do with their EBITDA. So that, that my friends, is how we drive strategic valuations and strategic outcomes. Let's keep going. Okay, so we've talked about financials and strategic um, investors. And the question now is how do you approach them uh, and how do you go about it? Next slide. So this is where we get into actually driving the strategic process. The one thing I would say is a process is there and like every entrepreneur, a process is there to be broken. <laughs> so um, it's very important not to let your process strictly drive the way you approach it. I'll give you a great example. Say we're talking to uh, three strategic investors. You've told them the deadline for an IOI or an, you know, kind of a memorandum of understanding is three months from now. And then about, you know, call it 25 days before the deadline, another strategic comes to the table. And they're like, there's no way in 90 days are we going to be able to give you kind of what we're thinking and have that conversation. Well, what you're going to do is you're going to find a way to stretch out the process with the other folks. And so even in the process of asking for numbers and asking for offers, we actually say, we'll give you a deadline when the time's appropriate. What we're really doing is making sure that we've got at least four or five other people ready to give us um, an MOU before we ask and put a deadline on, on the, a, a deadline out there. <clears throat> and so in all this time, our job is to figure out how to create opportunities for the strategic investor to fall in love with the business. And that's, that's really critical. So we have a process we follow in general, but the best outcomes are where you're not saying, hey, in three months, I've got to do a deal. Where you're saying, no, in nine, six months, nine months, 18 months, whatever it takes to run the process to where we have enough people to join some kind of soft auction so we can kind of bid for the best player. And we can actually, but mind you, it's a two-way street. It's not just about them falling in love with you, but in some cases, it's your baby. And you want to make sure that it's it's being put in the hands or you're going to be part of something with them that's going to be uh, in the kind of way you want it to be. One statistic that's interesting, <clears throat> when a majority or a major minority um, investment is made, the statistics on founders actually leaving the business um, are quite significant. So uh, very often you'll find that within two years, the founders or owners are saying, I'm done. This is not where I thought it was going to be. I'm out. And, uh, you know, with private equity, that gets very problematic because you don't usually get to get as many chips off the table either. And so now you find yourself in a really tough spot. Another thing with private equity, when, when they do a minority play, is they'll put in some, some money and then they'll say, well, there's another need for capital. And usually you don't have deep pockets the way a private equity firm does. And so it's almost like a, I can get to the majority without having to pay the premium because I now on the next capital call get the majority. Is everyone following that point? That's a big danger in the world of um, private equity minority deals that then turn into majority. Okay, let's keep going. So look, there's strategic investors come in all forms. And one of the things we love about being industry agnostic is we've actually had deals where a um, uh, Alaskan native organization ended up buying a SaaS business or investing in a SaaS business. We've had deals where we've had a Japanese insurance company become the highest bidder for investment in a telecommunications company in North America. You never know where it's going to come from or why. In some cases, the insight's something like, well, I've got a tax reason to do that deal. In some cases, it's, you know, I've got a family member who has a hobby here and they love this industry. Uh, in some cases, it's something is about geographic, uh, getting into the marketplace and testing the waters. So you never quite know why a strategic is doing it. So one of the things I find as a very common pitfall is some PE firm reaches out on LinkedIn, you send them a data room, you have no idea why you're sending it or what's the context. And then all of a sudden they go, thank you very much, not interested. Well, we don't even know if they know what your business really is. And so getting the ability to sort of control information strategically so that you can have those real conversations before sharing anything is a best practice. Let's keep going. Uh, these are some examples of where these strategics come from, a supplier, a competitor, a customer, adjacent industry, 
um, somebody who has a similar customer base as you, this is where we tend to find these sorts of folks. Next slide. So actually these are um, against, again, anonymized examples, but you know, this is a healthcare mind map that was produced going into the process. And sometimes there'll be up to 250 to even in some cases, a thousand strategics that you look at and talk to and run through your process before you find the one that makes the most sense. And that's oftentimes why we recommend having some form of uh, representation because the goal is to use your time wisely to keep the business on the rails and keeping it going well while someone's vetting these and then strategically leveraging. Another thing I'll just say by having a third party, and this is whether it's us or someone else, is, is that you get to be the escalation path in the process. So if you're an owner of a company, you get to be the one to say, I got to say, hey, I got to take, I got to go um, see if Victoria is okay with this before I even entertain this any further. And that that's really critical is, is we'll hear things directly from the folks that are looking at this that you they may not tell you directly because they've got to keep a great relationship with you. So having that escalation path is really important. You know, the greatest athletes in the world have an agent. Um, you know, that's just the, kind of the way of it because it allows them to focus on what they do well, which is running the business. And so that's something to think about. Um, keep going here. I don't think it's we need to get into all the details, but it can get crazy and extensive. And that's the main moral of the story here. So far, so good? Just looking for, okay. All right, let's keep going. So here's an example where we looked at company X again. You know, they had these three, what we thought would pay the highest multiple or do the most interesting deal. And then we had a couple out there that we go, we got to go and kick the can and see what else comes up from these other categories. So you build these mind maps, you build the list and you go out and see what's up. In this particular case, we had these top three. Next slide. You see that these are the kinds of uh, strategic investors who are identified. So you're going to go and approach these, but you're going to approach all of these in a different way. Each one of these categories probably has different considerations. So it's very important to know what's your message going into these different groups. And here's just an example. Company X, next slide. And I don't want to spend too much time reading every line, but you can understand, you can imagine that the materials and metals folks, they've got huge inflation pressures. They're going to care about that. The aerospace folks, frankly, don't care about EBITDA. <laughs> they care about capability and winning the contract with the government, right? So you kind of understand what they care about. And then you start telling the version of the story that's going to be tailored to that group. And that's so critical. I mean, anyone who's done any kind of consumer marketing knows the importance of targeting. But in this case, it's targeting and listening, targeting and listening, targeting and listening, and then hearing what their thesis is. And it might be something you don't even think or know was critical to them as to why they're willing to go and do this. So sometimes we hear things like, WhatsApp was, uh, you know, there was a transaction there with Facebook for $19 billion. People thought it was insane. And then you learn that the one missing piece of data that Facebook had was mobile phone numbers for the global community. And the worth of having all those phone numbers meant they could do all kinds of new things. And then they go, well, that's a cheap to pay for the amount of phone numbers they just acquired uh, and the connections that all those people have to one another. So that's really how we think about strategic LinkedIn, Microsoft, another great example. Okay, next one. And here's the company, uh, Y. Can we go to the next slide? You know, they have these different kinds of bars and strategic investors. And then you go to the next one and uh, you see again, showcasing how this is different for different groups. Um, for example, one trend we're seeing a lot right now is say you're a, a hardware company, um, if you're able to demonstrably show the top line growth for a SaaS business and tie their software capability to your software, your hardware, those things are commanding major multiples right now, big, big multiples. So it's kind of like you have to have either software, service, AI, or hardware, or two or three of the four, and you're driving crazy multiples right now. So, um, you know, really understanding maybe, maybe just having your piece allows that company to position itself differently in the marketplace and attract capital or attract um, uh, public funds. And then just to kind of round it out, because I didn't want to skip the so, sort of basic stuff, but, you know, this is a typical process. You got your deal prep. I think someone asked, what is a SIM? A, a SIM is a confidential information memorandum. Basically, it's a fancy way of saying it's a book with all the confidential information about your company 
that once a strategic investor is far enough along in the process, you share that with them so they can have all the data and the story in one place to kind of understand your business. And there's a lot of thought that goes into how you position your business in that confidential information memorandum. Uh, then you're going into outreach and you're staggering the outreach place and then you're going to the closing. And, you know, for many people may not be aware, but, you know, just because you've got an offer does not mean you've got a deal closed. There's probably another 50 things that can go wrong along the way. And so uh, it's very important to have your story straight uh, and make sure your business is, is prospering during that time. Or maybe all of a sudden you get another big customer signed right as you're about to negotiate and they go, whoa, we're really smart for logging them in at this agreed upon opportunity. And in the case of PE, I will tell you statistically, more than half the time they'll renegotiate. They'll come in, offer you 40, then tell you it's worth 30 after they looked at the books. And then, you know, you're like, well, I don't want to take that deal, but you've kind of given up your other opportunities and you find yourself in trouble. Uh, one of our most infamous stories is we ended up exiting a business in this case, <clears throat> which was a $40 million offer. They retraded for 30 instead of 40. And we sold the exact same company to that same PE firm for 108. And the way we were able to achieve that was we understood that this was going to serve as a strategic platform for their larger PE thesis for their company. And without that piece, they would have been in big trouble. And, and that's, when, that's what you learn when you run a soft auction and take your time and, and don't just take the first offer. Next. You know, a typical process um, will go from six to sort of 18 months depending on the complexity of the deal and the process. Um, though I've seen things go as quick as three, uh, we've seen things happen sometimes in five. You know, they think they're going to do it, but then they take a couple of rounds of capital to create more value, and then they find themselves on the other side of this. Keep going. You look, one of the things that, a little bit of a plug here for what we do is because we have direct relationships for over 20 years and we have a lot of C-suite advisors, we're able to get to the actual decision maker. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of relationships in this business. You can have the best story, the best SIM, the best management presentation, a great business, but if it's not being seen by the right person, good luck. So a big part of the game is getting to the right people. Uh, this is an example of a project where we had the Antwerp and the Singapore Port Authority um, basically bid for a, bank, uh, a British Columbia-based organization. And in this case, they did not buy the company. They did a strategic investment. And, and today, um, both the father and the daughter of this, this organization uh, were able to triple their upside after the sale by sticking around with the organization. And their revenues were very limited, but they had strategic assets that were very useful. This was a rail, a rail infrastructure project, for example. Next one. This is one where we were able to get 466 times uh, what the client had expected originally. We call that a great outcome. <laughs> um, and in this particular situation, uh, they were in a nascent industry. They had international reach. And the, the group was trying to get into this was making a massive bet from their endowment. It was a nonprofit because they figured, hey, we need something to, to be in the future. And they had to make a big bet. And they were able to structure a deal where the, uh, in particular, the, the founder and owners were able to capitalize on their upside as well. So there was a nice payment plus a nice long tail on the uh, long term of that deal. So everybody won in that situation. Okay. Let's talk about negotiating the best outcome. Uh, I think we can skip this, go ahead. So we always come back to owners, um, outcomes. You know, one of the things we pride ourselves in is it's one thing to get a high number, but sometimes you hear owners say something like, I'll take 5 million less if it goes into the hands of where my employees are greatly taken care of. Um, sometimes you hear, hey, I really don't want this company because of its deep tech in the hands of a foreign uh, country that we don't particularly see eye to eye with right now. Sometimes you'll have um, an outcome that's silly, like, hey, I'd like to make sure that my, uh, my child gets to be part of the management team. You never know what their outcomes are. Um, sometimes it's, look, I, I really want this to be a catalyst for long-term support. So, hey, I'd like to contribute something to charity through the process. And I want to structure the deal in a way that allows me to do that in a tax efficient way. There's all kinds of outcomes. 
And we always ask, okay, what's the number? You know, that's part of it. Um, one of my favorite stories about company X, if I remember if it's here, but um, in this particular founder's case, his co-founder going into the company um, uh, passed away just as they were starting the company. And one of the things he said to me was, I want to be able to take care of that person's family for the rest of their life at the end of this transaction. I'll tell you, there's nothing more motivating to a guy like me when I hear a story like that uh, about uh, what, what we can do to actually change the lives of these owners and their entrepreneurs. And so we try to really get the outcomes as our true north. When we run a process, come back to what they said and required is kind of, hey, I'll take it for this. Preferred is what I think would really make me happy. And we try to exceed. And we, we at, our, at our firm in particular, we don't follow something called the Lehman model, which is where you cap it out a certain structure on your fee. We actually say, hey, to an entrepreneur, if we end up getting you a higher number, an outcome, then we would like to see a higher percentage. And a lot of entrepreneurs are willing to share with you a, a higher percentage of something they never thought they were going to see. So it's a very incentivized, mutually aligned process. And it's so critical to do this. And by the way, you know, even with particularly with strategic um, investors, they love to understand why you care, what makes you tick. Um, I can't tell you when you're at that dinner, having that conversation with a strategic investor, they're people. And, and very often, you know, you try to kind of be closed off and hold your cards to the vest, but people make decisions because they like people. And hearing, hearing your reasons and what you've built and why you're looking to have a strategic help you take you to the next level without diluting your business, um, that's the kind of thing that actually does help people understand why you're doing it. And it's always important to know why you're motivated to go down this road. So let's keep going. This was company Y, um, great, great group of founders. And uh, we'll just keep going here. <clears throat> I wanna just go to now best practices in negotiation. So look, uh, there's a million people who think they're the best negotiators in the world and I'm not gonna pretend I'm the ultimate expert. Here are just some observations on what we found have worked in, our, in, our, in what we do. First is come back to outcomes. So remind yourself your true north because sometimes it's okay to walk away from a deal. And if it doesn't meet your outcomes, that's the easiest way to know something in my gut's not feeling right, I'm gonna walk away. Funny enough, the offshoot of that is when that happens, usually it causes the strategic to say, what about this don't you like, let's figure it out. So you gotta be willing to walk away and you've gotta be willing to stay true to your outcomes. Two is, um, you know, we try to move the conversation away from a discounted cash flow conversation to NPV, net present value, IRR. These are all fancy financial terms for how lots of financial corporate finance people will look at investing. If I put this much of money in and my interest rate is wide to get that money, and then I'm investing in your business, then I need X amount of return for this to do it now versus if it takes five years to see a return. Well, frankly, to the financial uh, investor, I don't care. That's interesting, thank you. But to a strategic, the conversation is, when you integrate this into your portfolio, what's gonna happen? And I can assure you the numbers are gonna look way more interesting when we understand how they'll integrate that into to their business. Um, always have two to three forecasts. So, you know, the traditional CEO is taught until they're blue in the face, you know, give a forecast, beat it, right? So oftentimes when we ask, uh, one of our partners to say, tell us, share with us your forecast. What we find is they're giving us the watered down version of what they're gonna hit because that's what they shared with their board. We always want that. But if you're familiar with anchoring and negotiation, you give them a hyper growth forecast too, that says, if these things go really well, we're gonna be here. And sometimes you give them even a third, if these things go really, really well, we'll be here. What you're doing is you're moving the conversation from the anchoring on the organic, which is what they're going to try to do, to there's these other scenarios. And then you play a little bit to their ego and say, well, you're the big dog in this space. Surely you know how to turn this on with all your channel partners. And they go, yeah, we do. Okay, so now we've moved the conversation from organic to something closer to the hyper growth or the hyper hyper growth. So it's a very important to showcase two or three examples of a forecast. Now, the danger is if you say, I'm going to hit this, and then you're part of the long term of that organization, well, they're going to hold you accountable to that forecast and drive your earn out against that. So there's lots of ways we can talk about that in the Q&A, perhaps, of how you kind of manage through that process. Um, follow strategic information sharing. So 
I can't tell you how many times a data room is shared before we even know why they're talking to us. And this is until we get involved. So I, I have to, I have to be really clear here, you know, from day one, be careful what you share. And even when you're in the process, be careful what you share. Even uh, on a retail deal, for example, we never share the buy store SKU information or buy store performance data. Because if they're a competitor of yours, all they're going to do is find out your good and bad stores in, specific, in particular locations. So we anonymize that information. And then we tell you the macro story and only post diligence. As the check is clearing, do you get to see that information. Um, so I can't stress the importance of information sharing that's strategic. Um, it's so common to say, I mean, a lot of times I get on a call and the strategic investor says, okay, can you give me an idea for what this company is worth? What's the general range? Da, da, da. I don't answer the question. I don't care what they say, but that's where I have to be a politician and say, well, let's talk about that instead. I never want to talk numbers because here's the problem. If I put a number on a piece of paper in an MOU, an IOI, um, and that's the number. That means I've gone to someone in my company, signed off on a number, and that means to get beyond 50% more than that number is going to be very difficult. So we avoid talking about numbers and make sure they're falling in love and see your vision and you see their vision before we start talking about numbers. And that's so critical. It's so easy to say, give me a number and make it easy, but I can tell you you're leaving a lot on the table if you're focused on that right away. Customize the process to each buyer. We talked about that or in a strategic investor. Be collaborative and transparent. Something will go wrong in the process. I have not done a, a deal till today where something crazy hasn't gone wrong at the 11th hour and you're like, oh no, deal's gonna be killed. We're all stressed out. Everyone thought we're here. This is where the relationship of transparency and collaborative, mind you, they've put in a lot of energy to go down this road. Chances are someone in the GM, VP, SVP, CEO position has gone internally to their board, their, their strategic uh, you know, controller office and their CFO and signed off on some kind of number of what they're going to do. And they've got buy-in. Once they've got that buy-in, that's when you know, and you know, forgive the analogy here, but that's when they're partially, or not partially, but that's when they're pregnant. They're going down this road, whether you like it or not. That's when you have the most leverage. It's not like they're going to want to pull out of a deal at the last second because they've now already got approval from up above and they've agreed this is strategic to go do. So having, if something does go wrong, if you've been collaborative and transparent from the start, chances are the deal will close and you'll get to the finish line as you share information with each other. Sometimes I hear something like, you know what? Um, I just can't get this one part of my organization over the line on this particular topic. I say, great, let's change this term. Let's increase the term there. And it's, it's, you don't hear these things unless you have that kind of relationship with the strategic on the other side. Um, stay calm and friendly. Uh, I, can't, I can't stress to you enough. We're in a world where we're all uh, mentally exhausted, virtual you know, nomads in some cases, connection is not there a little bit of friendliness and a smile and a true genuine intent and positive energy goes a long way to get deals done. Uh, let's hey, keep going. Shamil, I want to yeah. make sure we leave some time for questions. Sure. So. Yeah, I think we're wrapped up here, right? We're almost done? Yeah. Wonderful. Um, uh, were there any last slides here just to bring it home? We do have a few more. I think we can go quickly. I mean, these are some of our returns. You know, these are great stories of this is the group that brought the Kiwi to America. Keep going, keep going. I can wrap this in a minute. Um, you know, this lovely family brought the Kiwi to America um, and a couple other grocery stores. We sold these folks. Great story there. If you want to watch the video, keep going. Yeah, well, that's, that's the story. Uh, here's another one. I think we could skip these for now. And then what else is left? Yeah, if they ever want to see some of the videos. But I want to thank you for being a very patient audience. And I'd love to hear what your questions are. So I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, I have actually have one for you. Uh, I work with a lot of companies uh, specifically around international strategy and expansion. And of course, one of the major and most effective ways that companies can get a foothold in foreign markets is is by acquisition um mm -hmm. and so my question is i mean obviously the 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 i i i see i see extreme value in what what you're saying in terms of in terms of looking at uh, synergies uh across markets etc 
how much of the work that S STS does is pure divestiture and exit in pure terms, and how much of it is M&A type work where you're looking strategically at bringing two parties together to make a bigger whole? Yeah, yeah. Most of what we do, like 80% or more, is traditional, um, call it sell side, you know, advising a smaller entity being acquired by a larger entity. We represent the small guy to make sure they get the maximum and then drive that process. Uh, sometimes we're doing some roll up. So we're helping a client, you know, acquire a few things down the journey to get to that strategic majority player coming in. Um, and occasionally, you know, we'll have scenarios where it just makes sense for them not to do a deal now. And that's okay, but we've got them further down, further down the line and something more interesting came about like a big commercial contract and that's okay. Um, so, but we, we are, we find that the traditional I bankers are kind of conflicted. They're trying to sell you debt. They're trying to sell you buy side, sell side, and oftentimes care a lot about their buy relationship more than their sell side relationship, which is their client. So we try to be very uh, pure in a sense, if we can. Uh, by the way, I'd like to invite everyone, if they can come on video, this is for this part of the convo, it would just be great to see faces Absolutely. as we're talking. And please feel free to jump in with your questions here. Um, I have a question. Um, you referred to um, a scenario where a company, um, yeah, the, the offer was 40 million, it went down to 30, and then you yeah. ended up getting it for sold for like 108 because right. you because somehow somebody found out what their strategic value was of this and that they needed to have. It. How did you find that out? And in general, how do you find out what the the potential acquirer really cares about? You just asking them? Tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. You know, I don't want to sound simplistic, but part of it is when we're in the room and oftentimes our client isn't in the room, they tell us things. It's just, just kind of the nature of the beast. Or, because if they want to do something, they're giving you signals that I want to do it. I just need to, and we try to understand what it is. But the other thing in this particular case, we ran a, we made it clear to them that their offer wasn't good enough. We went out to the world to look for strategics. And then they realized we meant business that if they don't come and get clean and serious, um, that they're going to lose it. And they actually wanted it really badly. So, uh, you know, running a soft auction does not mean having 10, 15 people at the table. It means having three to five. And, you know, if you try to play the game of I'm going to give you all a deadline, all the 20 people who are interested come in at this time, and then we'll go from there, it, it gets very impersonal. And people get really frustrated. I don't want to bid in some vacuum. I don't know what's going on. I actually try to do my best to make every strategic think that, hey, you are really the first choice, but your offer is not good enough. So, um, so your answer is that, you know, some of it just occurs during uh, conversation sort of happenstance almost that, you know, throughout a long process. Mm -hmm. But are, are you not asking like deliberate questions to try to find out? So what are you really looking for? What's your corporate strategy? Are you asking them to talk about their corporate we, strategy? We, we are, we are, we are, okay. especially when we meet in person. I mean, I, I'll be, you'll be shocked how much we shared with you when you're over a dinner and a bit of wine, <laughs> frankly, mm -hmm. they'll tell Wonderful. you what they're really thinking. <laughs> Windsor has a question. Windsor, go please go ahead. Hi there. Thank you so much for a very informative presentation. Very clear. Question is around STS and is there any sort of expertise or specialization within certain verticals is the first question. And then the second question is, what's the typical range of transactions mm -hmm. that you all represent? Yeah, we, we are purposely uh, not specialized. Uh, and, and we think there's a lot of value in not being specialized because if we only want had two industries, it would focus on, you know, the buyers in those two industries. And, and before you know it, you care more about those relationships. Now, mind you, you've also attracted 33 entrepreneurs to come to a firm. And so they need a bit of freedom to play. <laughs> Otherwise, it's not their culture. <laughs> so um, what, we, what we do have is amazing strategic experts per industry. So we have 4,200 advisors. Many of them are industry vertical experts we bring onto the deal. Um, our, our, our kind of middle 50% of our deals are between 50 million and 250 million enterprise value. Um, our kind of bottom 25 or quartile would be below 50 million. And our top quartile is between 250 and about 3 billion. So that's kind of where we, we done, we gone as high as 5 billion, but now you, once you get beyond four, you're in IPO territory. That's not where we play. 
Um, but there's, we find that the majority of transactions in the world are in this sort of mid, mid market or upper mid market, which is kind of broadly 50 to, uh, to two to 3 billion. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Joshua. Yeah, uh, quick question. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for the talk. It was excellent. Um, any, do you ever do uh, more straight up technology sales for companies that might have great technology, but are either early on in the revenue game or pre-revenue? Sure. And the special considerations there. Yeah, we, 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 um, we do take on companies in what we call our value max. Uh, but we're, look, we're not experts at driving your biz dev pipeline. Sometimes by running a process, we'll uncover a major strategic commercial deal. And we like to get compensated for that, for getting you a massive client in the process. But more likely, we could, we could um, bring you along to some of our world-class partners that we've partnered with. We'll say, help them get commercial traction, work with them, and then we'll get ready to take them. So it'll almost be like it will work with you from your whole journey early on, but we're not kind of the main person driving it until you get a little further along. We have great partners in that world, by the way, if you're, if you're interested. So Hugh uh, had a question. Hugh, could you um, turn on your mic and um, and our camera? Hi, thanks, Samuel. Um, hey. Typically, when you're approaching these uh, strategic acquirers, are you going after like the corporate development team or the finance team or like business unit leaders? And then how can companies start building that relationship? Yeah, great, great question. Um, we generally don't like talking to the corporate development people. <laughs> um, you know, they have a thesis, a set of rules, and think about it from this. You're a corporate development person. The people with the real power in the organization are the PL leaders. And your job is to bring them something interesting. Eight out of 10 times you get laughed out of the room for being silly. Why do you bring this to me and waste my time? So we like to go to the PL leader or the CEO or, or the board level and then have the corporate person evaluate it and then make them an ally as they would navigate how to sell it internally, because they're the best at doing that. So not that we have a problem with them, but we've found historically that's not always the best play. Excellent. Uh, next question is from uh, Saurabh. Uh, do you want to go ahead, Saurabh? Sure. Thanks a lot for the talk, uh, Shamil. Just building upon a prior question around technology companies, I think one of the apprehensions is the conflict of interest. So I wouldn't want to, you know, potentially... In most of the cases for a startup uh, or let's say an early stage company, uh, the competition is already a multi-billion dollar company. And these are also your strategic. So how do you kind of ring, uh, ring fence that kind of uh, exposure where your IP is at risk? Yeah, fair question. Um, just getting a little bit granular, you know, I didn't really talk about this, but when we do our outreach, we go anonymous. So first step in the process is we put out a, a teaser that has nothing that actually marcates the company directly, like a just broad company in North America focusing on this broad space. We don't use words you use in your marketing because people will search that and find you quickly. Um, and so that's why we actually try to then ask them, well, who are you and why do you care? <laughs> you know, why do you want to look at this? What's your reason? And it's almost like we're asking them to give us a reason to introduce Surab to this company. Um, and in that process, we start to get a feel, you know, these guys are wasting our time. These guys are serious. Um, look, when it comes to IP and all that kind of protection, look, we do have very ironclad legal documents that get signed as they get more information. The truth of the matter is you can never fully protect from that. Um, but for most of these big companies, look, if you've got something they want, the reason they're talking to you is because it's easier to buy than to build. Um, it's really rare that they're thinking to themselves, Hey, you know what? I'm just going to go get a bunch of information and then, you know, make a case to build a business unit. Um, if you've got traction in your market, it's so much easier to just say, come on board. Uh, one last question from Robert. Super yeah. quick, Robert. Yeah, quick one to wrap up. Yeah. Um, any any uh, general uh, generalization you can make about how often um, it's a, an entire acquisition of a company versus um uh, a, a part of it, like if it were a medical device or a, a pharma company being a particular disease indication, but then they keep the company to sell for other things or technology would be used in only one industry, but they keep it to serve other industries. Yeah, um, I think I've got the questions. Maybe correct me if I haven't, but um, so normally if you have a couple pieces to your business, we go in knowing what parts are up for grabs. 
So we, we're, we're going to actually normalize that out as part of the process. Now, there's something called a secret menu, like, hey, by the way, for this group, they might want this piece as well. But we, we generally have to kind of share it as a standalone, what it's going to be for. Um, so almost, I'll give you the great example, when Bayer was divesting uh, Dr. Scholl's, for example, they, they put it all together as a Dr. Scholl's business, even though it was part of a larger consumer division, right? Um, so that's how we would approach it. Now, I want to answer a slight different question that you didn't quite ask, but um, we oftentimes will see them as a full transaction or some kind of, uh, you know, take take some chips off the table in a big way, but then also make a get a potential second bite for helping us run this division. So um, those can be really lucrative. You know, when you get a deal like that structured the right way and you've got some fire in your belly, I wouldn't, I wouldn't poo-poo that. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Shamil, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. This was really a fantastic presentation. Um, really, really appreciate the insights. Uh, thank you, Angie and, um, and Jamie, for, uh, for helping us out today. Um, if I could Please just quickly say, if you've got yeah. my email address, uh, maybe Angie, you could put that in the chat, but we'd yeah, always, we'd always love to speak uh, if anyone would like to chat about their business or how we can be helpful, just founder to founder. Fantastic. And Robert, yes, a recording once 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 we go through, uh, it goes through our, um, our our studio for editing, we'll, we'll have this available. Um, and uh, Angie has just posted uh, emails for you to reach out. Um, on uh, our final uh, uh, our final uh, next webinar will be on J July 11th, and that's going to be with Mark Carmichael, Carmichael uh, and it's going to be about uncovering the true value of your business. So please uh, tune in for for our last of these really exciting webinars with STS. So thank you once again, Shamil. Really, really, really appreciated your time today. Thank you. I, I can tell there's a lot of great stories I haven't heard from people on the call. So I'd love to hear from you. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.